It's StackMic, diving into the first part of a screencast series on HTML5. Today, we are going to discuss the basics of HTML5 technology and CSS3 styling techniques, and make a web page that uses it and covers most of the concepts that I am going to talk about today. Hopefully, it will give you insight into HTML5 and CSS3 to help ease the pain that comes with transitioning to a slightly different syntax. Also, I will talk a little bit about microformats and implement two of them in the example web page. HTML4 has been around for nearly a decade now, and web developers seeking new techniques to provide enhanced functionality are being held back by the constraints of the language and browsers. To give authors more flexibility and enable more interactive and exciting websites, and applications, HTML5 introduces and enhances a wide range of features, including form controls, APIs, multimedia, structure, and semantics. Work on HTML5, which started in 2004, is currently being carried out in a joint effort between the W3C and the WHATWG. Many key players are participating in the W3C effort, including four major browser vendors. Apple, Mozilla, Microsoft, and Opera. While it's true HTML5 is a work in progress and is going to stay that way for some time, there is no reason not to start using it right now. HTML5 introduces a whole set of new elements which makes it much easier to structure pages. Most HTML4 pages include a variety of common structures such as headers, footers, and columns. Today, it's fairly common to mark them up using div elements, giving each a descriptive ID or class name. Here is how we used to lay out things in HTML4. The use of div elements is largely because current versions of HTML4 lack the necessary semantics for describing these parts more specifically. HTML5 addresses this issue by introducing new elements for representing each of these different sections. At first glance, with HTML5, the new elements immediately jump out and command attention. The W3C really listened to the community and planned for the future when architecting new elements. We have everything from basic structural elements like header and footer, to others like canvas, which allows for dynamic scriptable rendering of bitmap images, and audio, which defines sound such as music or other audio streams. It seems like all the new elements tap into a very powerful API. Let's finally start coding the actual page. Here is a layout that we'll be coding. It's a very basic layout which covers most of the elements that we can start coding using HTML5. Basically, it's the page's name and its slogan, a menu, a featured area, an area with posts, an extra section with some links, an about box, and finally a copyright statement. Let me load a basic markup for the page that I have already created. In the head section, I include two conditional comments for Internet Explorer. First one includes HTML5 shift file directly from Google code for all versions of IE. It's the only way to get IE to acknowledge the new elements. This nice mini script enables all the new HTML5 elements. The second one includes IE7.js for better backwards compatibility for Internet Explorer 7. Let's start coding the header of our page. The layout of the header is as simple as it gets. Let's add a header tag. The header element represents a group of introductory or navigational aids. Thus, it's more than logic that we use this to mark up our header. We'll also use the new nav tag which represents a section of the page that links to other pages or to parts within the page, a section with navigation links. Not all groups of links on a page need to be in a nav element. Only sections that consist of major navigation blocks are appropriate for the nav element. After adding a couple of IDs and classes, our header ends up like this. Next is the featured block. This is best marked up as an aside tag. The aside element represents a section of a page that consists of content that is in some way related to the content around the aside element and which could be considered separate from the content. Such sections are often represented as sidebars. We add several elements inside of the feature block. 
Firstly, this is an article which represents external content. The external content could be a news article from an external provider or, like in our case, some text from a blog. We also have two headings, latest blog post and HTML5 rocks, which is a post's name. So, we'll be using yet another new element, hgroup. This is a nice tag used for grouping series of heading tags, which is exactly what we have here. The last element in this block is a picture related to the post. We have yet another new tag for this element, figure. This tag is used to enclose some flow content, optionally with a caption that is self-contained and is typically referenced as a single unit from the main flow of the document. This tag allows us to use a legend tag to add a caption to the elements inside. Next is the document's body. That's where we put all of our content. This block represents a generic document section, so we can use a section element. For the posts, we'll use an OL element, exactly like we would do it in HTML4. Each LI should have an article tag, and inside of this, we'll have a header for the post title, a footer for the post information, and a div for the post content. We're going to use the HAtom microformat to represent the post, and I think it's a good time now to talk a little bit more about microformats. Microformats are a way of adding simple markup to human readable data items, such as events, contact details, or locations on web pages, so that the information in them can be extracted by software and indexed, searched for, saved, cross-referenced, or combined. Note that although HTML is the usual primary format, the same techniques and constructs can also be used together with XML formats like Atom and RSS to augment their existing vocabulary. You might ask, why to use microformats? First off, microformats are a huge step in the evolution of information architecture. It's a way for users to publish richer information themselves without relying on centralized services. If someone is already publishing essentially the same information as HTML, it makes a lot of sense to make the HTML machine friendly, as well as human friendly. By following simple conventions and using existing HTML constructs, regular web pages can encode machine-readable semantics. As I said earlier, we'll be using HAtom microformat to represent our posts. HAtom is a microformat for identifying semantic information in blog posts and practically any other place where Atom format may be used, such as news articles. Atom is a simple way to read and write information on the web. In a nutshell, it's just a well-documented XML format for both syndication and authoring of content. HAtom schema elements are based on Atom and follow the microformat pattern of prefixing a unique identifier, in our case it's H, on the outermost container elements, the feed or entry. The parts of this microformat are based on analysis of many blog, bulletin, board, and media posts. With all these tags and HAtom microformat in place, the list of our posts will look like this in HTML and like this in browser. The last element that we're going to implement today is the footer. For that, we'll use the footer tag, which will have both some about information and the copyright. It's important to understand that the footer element doesn't have to represent only the actual footer of the page. The footer element typically contains information about its section, such as who wrote it, links to related documents, copyright data, and the like. For the copyright statement, we'll use a regular paragraph tag, and for the about block, we'll use an address tag together with another microformat called hcard. hcard is a simple, open distributed microformat for representing people, companies, organizations, and places. Bloggers can both embed hcards directly in their web pages and style them with CSS to make them appear as desired. In addition, hcard enables applications to retrieve information directly from web pages without having to reference a separate file. We are done with the HTML layout for our page, and now it's time to look at the CSS. 
I've already written all CSS needed for the page, and now I'm just going to go over some of the CSS3 attributes that I used. CSS3 offers exciting new possibilities to create an impact with your designs, allows you to use more diverse style sheets for a variety of occasions and lots more. The development of CSS3 is going to be split up into modules. The old specification was simply too large and complex to be updated as one, so it has been broken down into smaller pieces, with new ones also added. Several of the modules have now been completed, including SVG, media queries, and namespaces. The others are still being worked upon. On the blog example page, I used several CSS3 properties that are now widely supported by browsers. The first one is border radius that we use for rounded corners. By adding the property, we don't have to worry anymore about using images or JavaScript for rounding corners or any elements. Next is the text shadow property that I use for links that are being rolled over. The property gives us a new cross-browser tool to add dimension to designs and make text stand out. For all selected text, I set a new pseudo-element called selection which lets us style how the text selection looks. This pseudo-element has only two properties for changing text color and background. The last thing I added is an advanced selector for any last element which we can access by using CSS. It's called last child and I'm using it to remove the margin bottom of any paragraph tag that's the last child of its parent. CSS selectors are an incredibly powerful tool. They allow us to target specific HTML elements in our markup without having to rely on unnecessary classes, IDs, and JavaScript. Advanced selectors can be helpful if you're trying to achieve a clean, lightweight markup and better separation of structure and presentation. They can reduce the number of classes and IDs in the markup and make it easier for designers to maintain a style sheet. In this screencast, we covered several cutting-edge technologies, and now it's safe to say that you can achieve an HTML5 layout, which uses microformats and CSS3, and that will work on past and current browsers without any problems. I hope you enjoyed watching this screencast. Stay tuned with TechMic screencasts by using our RSS feed or Twitter, and have a good day. Thank you.